purge purgatory. 89 biblical reasons to flush it because that's where it belongs. It is a doctrine of devils and we definitely want to defeat those and destroy those, annihilate those with the light and logic and soundness and integrity of the Word of God. Hello everybody, this is Mark Paxton with Bible Book Profiler and today we're going to be going over a blog article on purgatory and uh, the motto of my site is verify the truth of God's Word and that is Acts 17:11 in practice. Uh, this article it has grown into being the largest article I've got to date. It's last time I checked it was about 30,000 words. So it's a massive article on purging purgatory. So today I'm going to go over the introduction. I'm going to go through the biblical and spiritual summary which has 18 different sections to it and there's a link to each one of those sections so you can just jump right into whatever section you want and quickly find it and then we're going to go over uh, section number one the origin and history of purgatory proves it was invented by man and this is a pretty large section so i divided it up into four subsections and i got a uh, using the, the encyclopedia britannica as a reference and then I'll have a commentary on it, and then Encyclopedia Britannica, another commentary, and so forth uh, throughout the rest of the article. And so you're going to find some very uh, different information here than what you will see or hear on the rest of the internet. So in the introduction, it says this article was originally published on 825.15, is now being updated. I've got most of it done and uh, still working on some of the later sections and uh, we will see how that comes out. So it's important to know that this article is not coming to you by way of personal opinions, denominational bias, or complex and confusing theological theories, but through multiple objective authorities such as biblical or English dictionaries, ancient Greek manuscripts, or the laws of logic that are all in agreement. And some say that purgatory does not exist and they have a list of Bible verses against purgatory, like me. Uh, others, mostly composed of staunch Roman Catholics, of course, say that purgatory does exist and try to prove it. And uh, see the list of Bible verses used to support purgatory in section 17. It's pretty pathetic, uh, the verses that they uh, use to try to prove purgatory. It's pretty sad, very, very weak, and we'll see that later on in this video. Others have asked, where is purgatory in Bible? Or, where is purgatory in Bible verses? This research article will definitely answer those questions. And so if you think this is broken English, it is. I copied and pasted those phrases out of a keyword research tool and uh, plugged them in here so people could find out uh, more about purgatory. So nearly everybody has heard of purgatory, but what is it and are you ever going there? Let's find out. Here's the dictionary definition of purgatory. In the belief of Roman Catholics and some others, a condition or place in which the souls of those dying penitent are purified from venial sins. Wait till you, uh, we go over this venial and mortal sins section. Uh, it'll blow purgatory right out of the water. Uh, or undergo the temporal punishment that, after the guilt of mortal sin has been remitted, still remains to be endured by the sinner. Well, that's just total BS and we're going to destroy that with logic and the Word of God in, a, in another section, another uh, video. Italian is Purgatorio, the second part of Dante's Divine Comedy in which the repentant sinners are represented. And number three, 
any condition or place of temporary punishment, suffering, expiation, or similarity. And so purgatory is based upon the belief that when you die, your soul lives on for the purpose of being cleansed from your sins, which equals the usual false belief that you go to heaven when you die. So I'm going to address that right now. Uh, that link goes to this page on my website. It's a article called The Life After Death Lie. And it says, Is your soul immortal? And one of the key things is body, soul, and spirit, the key to understanding mankind and life in general. I'm going to go over that, all the details of that, in a later video. But here's a very brief summary of that. God formed our bodies out of the dust of the ground. God made our souls. And God created our gift of Holy Spirit. If people do not make the distinction, the clear distinction between these three things, then there's just you know hundreds of verses they're not going to understand in the Bible. And there's many things in life uh, they will not understand either. And so what is the true nature of death? That's another critical section I'm going to go over in a future video. But the idea that our souls are immortal is a lie from the God of this world who is Satan. All doctrines, religions, and theologies that teach some form of life after death, such as reincarnation, purgatory, or burning in the lake of fire forever, are based upon Satan's first recorded lie in the Bible, you shall not surely die. Think about that. And let's see, here we go. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And here's the definition of enemy. A person who feels hatred for, fosters harmful designs against, or engages in antagonistic activities against another. An adversary or opponent. The antonym or opposite is friend or ally. And therefore, by definition, death cannot help anybody or perform any good thing for anybody, such as take a person to heaven. Therefore, Christians do not go to heaven when they die. They go to the grave instead. So death is an enemy and not a friend. A friend would take you to heaven, but not an enemy. Enemies take you to the grave, but friends don't. Okay, so some very important questions there to think about in light of purgatory and uh, just a lot of, you know, traditional Christian beliefs that contradicts the Word of God. So purgatory is never mentioned in the Bible in word or concept. Okay, and purgatory contradicts well over a hundred verses of Holy Scripture on multiple, multiple subjects. There could be you know, several hundred different verses of Scripture that it contradicts. So the 89 there is, I, I stopped counting after that. <laughs> uh, one of the devil's purposes of purgatory is to drive people away from Christianity, which hinders evangelism. So now, here's the biblical and spiritual summary so that people can go right to uh, these uh, sections and see what they want to see or they can just skim through the whole uh, article uh, right here in this section and get, get the gist of it. And so, number one, the origin and history of purgatory proves it was invented by man. Number two, mortal and venial sins rendered purgatory irrelevant, meaningless, and useless. Number three, purgatory contradicts at least ten verses of scripture on the true nature of death. How about that? Number four, purgatory contradicts the true nature of body, soul, and spirit and the fall of man. There's lots of verses to back that up. Number five, the practice of praying for the dead 
and or believing in the lie of the dead making prayers not only contradicts the 10 plus Bible verses on death, but it's also based upon a lie from 2 Maccabees, which is another counterfeit apocryphal book and a mistranslation of a Hebrew word from Baruch, 1 Baruch, uh, which is another apocryphal book that counterfeits uh, the Bible. All right, I'm back. I had a little interruption from the dogs. Okay, so number six. Look at this. Purgatory violates seven verses on God's forgiveness of us. Think about that. Number seven. Purgatory does not make the crucial distinction between our fellowship with God and our sonship. Number eight. Purgatory contradicts all eight characteristics of God's wisdom and therefore purgatory is the wisdom of this world which is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Number nine, purgatory contradicts and totally ignores to over 28 verses on the mercy of the Lord which endures forever. Psalm 136, the entire chapter of that psalm is dedicated to the mercy of the Lord and I haven't even begun to count all the other verses in the Bible that uh, mention the mercy of the Lord so that's a huge uh, section there uh, number 10 purgatory violates at least seven verses on God's justice that's a huge one very important number 11 purgatory contradicts six verses in Ephesians all right, number 12, purgatory contradicts lots of miscellaneous scriptures, and I've only, you know, scratched the surface. Number 13, purgatory contradicts four verses regarding our new spiritual bodies at the return of Christ. Another critical uh, subject that nobody that uh, really believes in purgatory ever mentions. I wonder why. Number 14, don't blame the Lord. You must understand the Hebrew idiom of permission, which is a figure of speech where God allows evil to happen, but he is not the one who is actually causing harm. You see this very often in the Old Testament, such as with Genesis 6, verses 13 and 17. God did not flood the earth. How about that for a great uh, enlightening truth he allowed it to happen it was the devil who flooded the earth in a failed attempt to prevent jesus christ from being born so as with purgatory it is not a temporary punishment sanctioned by the lord that you must endure but it's a religious and corrupt work of satan instead so there's a great amount of enlightenment right there Number 15, purgatory is self-righteousness, which is by works instead of by grace, which is legalism and bondage. We're going to go over the four verses of scripture that talks about a person's own righteousness as opposed to the righteousness of God, which is by grace. Number 16, purgatory is torture and torture is inspired by a devil spirit called a sadistic spirit. Think about that. Number 17. The short list of verses used to justify the supposed existence of purgatory is based upon denominational bias, which is, we're going to cover that uh, this evening. Number two is ignorance of several subjects in the Bible, you know, multiple subjects, uh, the contradiction of, you know, purgatory is, you know, contradicts the definition of dozens of words in the Bible, and it also is a total lack of sound logic and biblical research from multiple objective authorities, and, you know, uh, purgatory is basically uh, just, you know, that church's opinions. They really don't have any solid biblical evidence. And then number 18 is witness the mathematical miracle of 1 Corinthians 3.12 that proves God is the only author of the Bible. And so now we're going to dive right into 
section number one, the origin and history of purgatory proves it was invented by man. And so I've got four subsections. We will probably uh, go through the first two. And so one of the highlights of this is that purgatory is contested. Christian traditions from the Encyclopedia Britannica, the oldest encyclopedia in the world since 1768 in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, the largest in the world outside of Wikipedia, which, you know, is good for some general uh, information, but it's not really considered uh, authoritative. It's really pretty corrupt, uh, to be honest with you. And uh, the most respected uh, encyclopedia in the world is the Encyclopedia Britannica. And so, quote, it says, Among Christians, the biblical warrant for purgatory is contested. Supporters of the Roman Catholic belief cite biblical passages in which there are intimations of the three major components of purgatory. Prayer for the dead, an active interim state between death and resurrection, and a purifying fire after death. And so now here's my commentary. What are intimations? That's not a uh, very commonly wor used word. Uh, intimation comes from the Latin word intimationem, which means an announcement. In English, intimation refers to a less direct form of communication. It's a suggestion or a hint rather than a blatant statement of fact. So right there, uh, the doctrine of purgatory has already lost a significant amount of credibility and integrity. The definition of intimation is also a slight suggestion or vague understanding. Not good. It's also an indirect suggestion. Look how weak that is. It's pathetic. Here's the di dictionary definition of suggestion. Uh, number two, A, the process by which a physical or mental state is influenced by a thought or idea, like the power of suggestion. B, the process by which one thought leads to another, especially through association of ideas. And number three, a slight indication or trace. Trace isn't very strong or authoritative. Furthermore, having intimations about what the Bible means and then building entire doctrines on it contradicts lots of verses. And so I'm going to show you a number of examples where entire sections of Scripture contradict this concept of intimations uh, in relation to purgatory. And so I'm going to contrast the standard of the Word of God versus this weak, pathetic, BS stuff uh, from purgatory like intimations. It's just ridiculous. Acts 1.3. It's really laughable. Uh, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. Talking about Jesus Christ and the word passion means suffering and death by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So let's break this down. What are many infallible proofs? Many. Not one, not two, not a few, not several, but many. This is the Greek word polis, Strong's number 4183, and means many, high in number, multitudinous, plenteous, much, great, in amount or extent. So uh, there's a massive amount of evidence right there. Number two, infallible. This is the Greek word tekmerion, Strong's number 5039, and means properly a marker, a signpost, supplying indisputable information. Well, that settles it right there. It also means marking something off as unmistakable and irrefutable. 
Look at that. Indisputable, unmistakable, irrefutable. That's how strong the Word of God is. It's perfect and it is eternal. Proofs, plural. This corroborates the many. See how that? You got a system of checks and balances here in the Word of God. Proof as opposed to unproven theories, opinions, biased data, and outright lies like what floods the media and the internet. And so here's a detailed definition of the word proof. Number one, evidence sufficient to establish a thing as true or to produce belief in its truth. Look at the strength of this. Sufficient, establish a thing as true. See that? It's got a solid foundation. Definition number four, the establishment of the truth of anything. There's the word uh, or concept of establishment again a second time. Number seven, an arithmetical operation serving to check the correctness of a calculation. Okay, so uh, there's the system of checks and balance mathematically. So, and math is a science. Number eight, mathematics and logic, a sequence of steps, statements, or demonstrations that leads to a valid conclusion. Look how strong that is. Many infallible proofs. That's the Word of God as opposed to the doctrine of purgatory, which is a slight indication, a trace, a vague understanding, indirect suggestion, intimations. Uh, that's just ridiculous. It's the idea of purgatory being a solid biblical doctrine is just absolutely laughable. Now look at this. Origin of proof first recorded in 17 uh, I'm sorry 1175 to 1225. It goes through Middle English and uh, Middle French, Late Latin and uh, from Latin probare uh, to test or find good. And look at this. It, isn't it ironic that the word proof entered the English language 50 years before and in the same century as the Council of Lyon, France in 1274 where no proof of purgatory was offered. How about that? What an iron, ironic uh, thing there. Now let's go to Nehemiah and contrast that with purgatory and the vague understanding. Nehemiah 8 verses 8 and 12 so they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Look at that. You can already see there's a problem with purgatory just in the great contrast between the word of God and purgatory. Verse 12, And all the people went their way uh, to eat and to drink and to send portions of their food for others and to make great mirth, a great celebration, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Look at this. In verse 8, the word sense is the Hebrew word sekel. Strong's number 7922 and is used 16 times in the Old Testament. 8 is the number of resurrection and a new beginning. So 16 is double that establishing it and intensifying it. That's the third time we've run into the concept of establishment. It was a great new beginning in their lives once they finally understood the scriptures. This is why they had such a great celebration. And so look at this. The definition of intimation is a vague understanding which contradicts Nehemiah 8.8 8, where they uh, read in the book uh, the law of God distinctly and gave the sense that established new beginning and caused them to understand the reading. Okay? And so 
here again is a definition of intimation, vague understanding, which uh, is a open door for Satan to steal the word from you. Not good. You know, I'm going to be saying that a lot uh, in this video and, and throughout these, this whole series. It's a brand new series on purgatory. Not good. Uh, maybe I should make a t-shirt about that uh, on purgatory. It's just uh, insane. Matthew 13. Here's the parable of the sower and the seed. And he spake many things unto them, talking about Jesus Christ uh, in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he had sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Verse 19 is the explanation. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one, and catches away that which is sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. Not good. The wicked one is the devil. And the devil has an entire army of devil spirits. There's, you know, dozens of different categories. And they function in two hierarchical levels. You got your leadership uh, devil spirits uh, known by the Greek word daimon and then you've got the lower ranking devil spirits that they control known as the daimonion those are the two levels of power and versatility and command that those two uh, levels of devil spirits have that's the oper that's how they operate it's just like an army and there are devil spirits that work in people, in situations uh, around the world that can steal the word of God out of people's hearts if it is not established. We mentioned establishment three times. And that is what the word of God does is it gets us established in the truth. Ephesians talks about being rooted and grounded in love and uh, the uh, Colossians talks about rooted and grounded uh, in the Word of God okay and that's radically different than this just asinine vague suggestions and vague understanding slight suggestions intimations about purgatory so do you want uh, a chain made out of wet toilet paper or do you want the uh, titanium version of a chain which is the Word of God so there's no comparison here now look at Luke here uh, Luke chapter 1 in an Amplified Bible and again we are contrasting the precision of the Word of God and contrasting that to purgatory and all the BS associated with it Luke 1 since as is well known many have undertaken to compile an orderly account of the things which have been fulfilled among us by God verse 2 exactly as they were handed down to us by those with personal experience who from the beginning of Jesus Christ's ministry were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word that is of the teaching concerning salvation through faith in Christ verse 3 it seemed fitting for me as well and so I have decided after having carefully searched out and investigated all the events accurately from the very beginning to write an orderly account for you most excellent Theophilus that's the second time orderly or, or the concept of order has been mentioned and uh, look at this uh, investigated all the events accurately okay and uh, the orderly account again and look at this other term exactly so we got orderly twice uh, exactly once accurately once all that directly contrasts with the BS of purgatory which is a vague understanding 
So do you want the exact truth or a vague understanding and have the adversary rip you off? You know, make a decision. Okay, verse 4. So that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. That is the history and doctrine of the faith. There you go again. No, not question, not now, not doubt, not have a vague understanding, not hope and prayer that you know you might be right. Look at look at how the word of God is so sure, so solid, and so exact and precise and in great perfect order compared to the doctrines, commandments, and traditions of men which cancel out the word of God. Now, here's another section of scripture, Luke 24, that contradicts purgatory once again. And behold, verse 13, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And one furlong is 220 yards or 201 meters. So the total distance was, was about seven and a half miles or 12 kilometers. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden. They were spiritually held shut. This has to be from a devil spirit influence uh, that they should not know him. And look at this. Here's the cooperation of that. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus Christ divided the entire Old Testament into three categories. The law, which is also called the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and all the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the rest. And then also the rest of the writings like uh, you've got Psalms and Proverbs and uh, you know first and second Kings and, and those types of writings those are the three categories of the Old Testament that all speak or concerning Jesus Christ he is the red thread of the Bible uh, if you count correctly there are 56 books of the Bible, not 66, and Jesus Christ has a unique identity in each of those books. For example, in Hosea, he is the latter rain. Uh, you've got the former rain and the latter rain. And the former rain softens up the soil so that you can plant your seeds. Okay, and then the latter rain, after those seeds have sown, been sown and grown a little bit, uh, then the latter rain causes them to grow and to bear fruit. And that's what Jesus Christ does. You know, when we're in the correct alignment and harmony with God through Jesus Christ, then we can grow and produce fruit in our lives. And that understanding of Jesus Christ being the red thread of the Bible look what the result was of that verse 31 and their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight and they said one to another did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us uh, the scriptures look at that's the second time the word open is used just in the that couple of verses. Here's the definition of open. Strong's Concordance number 1272. And look at this. It is used eight times in the New Testament. Okay. And um, that other word in 
the Old Testament was you the word sense was used 16 times uh, in the New Testament and it's because we have that open uh, and uh, enlightened understanding of the Word of God because of who Jesus Christ is in each book of the Bible you see how that fits together Old Testament is a new beginning a new understanding established the New Testament here the word open is used eight times and eight is the number of resurrection and a new beginning it's used three times in Luke 24 alone so uh, that's the eye-opening understanding new understanding that you get with the rightly divided Word of God and not purgatory it's the Greek word uh, dianoigo to open up completely that's the verb and it's used in the sense of I open fully and that word dianoigo comes from uh, dia Strong's number 1223 all the way across all right uh, there was uh, some times where uh, Jesus went all the way across the Sea of Galilee okay and then also number 455 and noigo the process to open fully properly open fully by completing the process necessary to do so so that is a complete and open opening of our understanding uh, I've got a, another blog article and uh, there was a 30 second video I put on there where a guy climbed up to the top of Mount Everest and he did a panoramic 360 degree view of the top of Mount Everest the highest point on planet Earth and he could see basically you know a huge portion of the of the land below uh, with zero uh, you know blockages no blind spots whatsoever uh, that's what it's like spiritually to have our eyes open to the truth and integrity and precision of the Word of God and so here's another section of the word in Ephesians 3 that contradicts all that information about the uh, purgatory and and intimations how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four in few words Paul did mention the mystery in uh, Corinthians and uh, in Romans uh, before he wrote the book of Ephesians and it was Ephesians chapter 3 where the great mystery was revealed for the first time in all of history whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ so even if God gives us a mystery his will is for us to know and understand that mystery okay uh, contrast that with the vague understanding and all that uh, weak very weak uh, foundation of purgatory so verse 11 according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him look at that uh, strength of confidence we can have that confidence because we can put the Word of God together accurately and precisely and confidently because we know the exact truth okay that's the standard of the word now we're gonna hit subsection number two can you say denominational bias from Encyclopedia Britannica again these texts yield a consistent notion of purgatory however only when viewed from the standpoint of the formal Roman Catholic doctrine which was defined at the Council of Lyon France in 1274 the Council of Ferrara Florence the council started in Basel Switzerland then moved to Ferrara Italy and finally to Florence Italy from 1438 to 1445 and then the 
Council of Trent in northern Italy from 1545 to 1563 after a prolonged period of development by Christians and theologians. So this is just uh, crazy. You know, it says, uh, talks about the notion of purgatory uh, only when viewed from the standpoint of the formal Roman Catholic Church doctrine. That reminds me of a uh, three research articles I did on the Book of Mormon. And I just randomly decided to find out what that book was about. And uh, in essence, it's another counterfeit Bible inspired by Satan. Okay, how's that for some clarity? Uh, and uh, in that research project that I did, uh, there was a section where you know, they were discussing the uh, archaeological finds in regards to some of the doctrines of the Mormon Church, the Book of Mormon, and uh, the interesting thing was that the Mormon scholars were at odds against every scholar on the planet, regardless of which church or, you know, spiritual belief they had. It was only the Mormon scholars that believed in their particular doctrine of Mormonism, okay? And as a matter of fact, a lot of those scholars uh, defected from the Mormon church because they saw that uh, they could not, uh, you know, verify the truth of what they were, what the Book of Mormon was saying. Uh, there was no evidence for it whatsoever from multiple objective authorities. And so you will see these patterns when you start researching different books, different religions, uh, different doctrines, and you compare them all to the Word of God, you're going to see the adversary, Satan, make the same mistakes over and over again, the same pattern. And uh, we're going to see that in greater detail in these videos. So there are three main concepts we're going to analyze in the order they occur in the text. The first is the notion of purgatory. Second is denominational bias. Purgatory is only supported by the Roman Catholic Church and, you know, a handful of other people maybe, but primarily through the Roman Catholic Church. And we're going to go over the definition of bias uh, or denominational bias here in a minute. Uh, and then we're also going to cover the dates of councils and the significance of the number 13. All right. So here's the notion of purgatory because that's what it says up here is the text yield a consistent notion of purgatory. It doesn't say many infallible proofs of purgatory, does it? That's what the Word of God says. Many infallible proofs of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ but no many infallible proofs for purgatory, only the notion of purgatory. You see how weak it is? You got to wake up and look what's going on here. The definition of notion from vocabulary.com. If you have a notion that you can swim across the ocean, you are probably wrong. Not good. What's that, the third or fourth or fifth time I've said that? Not good. A notion is an idea, often vague and sometimes fanciful. Look at that. That's the second time the word vague has come up in association with purgatory. Not good. Thumbs down. A notion is lighter than a theory and embraces a whimsy that a simple idea never could. So, well, I already mentioned this. This is the second time. Uh, the word vague has been used in association with purgatory. Not good. Based upon the definition of notion, the doctrine of purgatory has less credibility than a theory, which by definition means an unproven idea. Look at that. So again, it goes back to Acts 1-3 with the many infallible proofs, indisputable information. Uh, that is the word of God. And purgatory is less than a theory uh, which is an unproven idea 
In other words, it's just somebody's opinion. Somebody's freaking opinion. Look at this. Here's a definition of whimsy since that comes up uh, as a definition of notion. So we're going from one, you know, uh, pillar, foam rubber pillar to another. <laughs> you know, it's laughable, it's sad, it's ridiculous. You know, if you want a solid foundation, at least the Greek Parthenon, even though they were dealing with idolatry, at least it was made with, you know, dozens and dozens of solid uh, marble pillars to, to hold it up. And at least it had, you know, some strength and integrity uh, from a, uh, you know, a architectural point of view. This has nothing. This, you know, purgatory is as strong as, as wet toilet paper and used because you know what it's full of <laughs> here's the definition of whimsy whimsy is what a person who's a dreamer and out of step with the real world might have lots of look at that out of step with the real world that sounds like somebody that's locked up in a psych ward people who are full of whimsy are odd but often fanciful and lovely like Harry Potter's friend Luna Lovegood. Whimsy is also a whim, something you do just because you want to. If you that sounds like purgatory again. Hey, I just want to, you know, make up some BS religious belief and see what happens. If you find a postcard of Alaska and take that as a reason to move there, that could qualify as a whim as whimsy. Whimsy is irrational. Look at that, but playful. It's also an odd or fanciful or capricious idea. The trait of acting unpredictably and more from whim or caprice than from reason or judgment. So purgatory by definition uh, doesn't have any you know sound reason or sound judgment to it and the real world is life viewed through the light of the Word of God you know you you got to see the world through the light of Jesus Christ and the word that opens up our eyes to the light so that you can see the darkness because think about that, you know, Yoda said, hard to see uh, the dark side is. Well, why is the dark side hard to see? Because they're standing in the darkness to begin with. Think about that. When do you see the shadows? Only when there's light coming in to reveal what's in front of you. It's the light of God that shows the darkness of the world. But if you can't see the darkness, it's because you're in it. you got to wake up with the Word of God that is pure, perfect light. Here's the definition of fanciful, capricious, or whimsical in appearance, characterized by or showing fancy, suggested by fancy, imaginary, unreal. That's what purgatory is. It's unreal. It's imaginary. It's total BS fabricated by devil spirits. Led by fancy rather than by reason and experience. Whimsical. Now check this out. <laughs> you talk about accuracy and uh, humor. One of the definitions of notion from the Urban Dictionary defines it as a stupid idea. Look at that. And there's a phrase called notion sickness. The feeling you receive when an idea is so bad it makes you physically ill. Look at that, people. That's a perfect description of the effects of purgatory. It makes you physically ill. It's such a bad idea. That's notion sickness. Being fanciful, whimsical, or irrational is okay if you're playing in the park. But when it comes to rightly dividing the Word of God, there's a blatant contradiction. We've already seen multiple, multiple 
contradiction between purgatory and the precision and confidence and multiple uh, the many I, I, uh, many truths of the word the many infallible truths okay so second timothy 2 15 study to show thyself approved unto god a workman not some whimsical person playing in the park that's totally out of touch with reality a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth it's impossible to rightly divide the word of god if you are in an irrational state of mind that's what the con the uh, concept of purgatory does is it puts you in an irrational state of mind it's devil spirit influence now from subsections one and two above and based upon the definitions look at this long list confusion now i didn't go over confusion specifically but it's a consequence of all the pros and cons of purgatory you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth if you don't have the clear light and accuracy and integrity of the word of god like in luke and in acts that are in perfect order and exact and cause us to know and stand with confidence we got fanciful imaginary and unreal imagination well that's a real solid foundation for truth huh uh, intimation irrationality notion not to mention notion sickness <laughs> suggestion slight suggestion boy those are real authoritative terms huh vague twice whimsy the probability of being wrong combined with the encyclopedia britannica which emphasizes the contestability twice and you have zero 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 biblical spiritual or divine authority for purgatory look at this the doctrine of purgatory wasn't established until 14 and a half centuries after the last book of the bible was written uh, the vast majority of scholars say uh, the book of revelation was written somewhere between 95 and 100 a.d including three centuries of fierce debate from the late 1200s to the mid 1500s okay so this alone tells us it's a very weak and dubious man-made theology without any credible basis scholarly biblical research or critical thinking skills look at that no critical thinking skills just all imagination you know somebody was smoking some really good dope when they came up with purgatory i tell you what and that makes me think of pharmacia in galatians 5 which talks about witchcraft pharmacia being or the use of drugs you know both legal and uh, illegal uh, and that screws up your mind and is an opens your minds up for devil spirit influence and devil spirit possession there's lots of groups of people all over the world like these witch doctors and i seen some uh, things about all this crazy devilish stuff they do in Haiti and uh, Africa uh, where they have a witch doctor or some uh, shaman guy uh, you know make this potion and have everybody drink it and they get all these hallucinations they're playing with devil spirits he's getting them possessed with devil spirits and then they go through all kinds of crazy stuff and start uh, spewing out all kinds of devilish doctrines now here is denominational bias whenever there's a biased belief among a specific group of people like the mormons or the rc people that nobody else supports you know something is wrong okay uh here's the definition of bias noun 
a particular tendency, trend, inclination, failing, or opinion, especially one that is preconceived or unreasoned. What is that, the second or third or fourth time? Irrationality and insanity and unreasoned has come up. Here's another definition of preconceived notion an opinion. How many times has that come up? An opinion formed beforehand without adequate evidence. There it is again. Look at that. No adequate evidence for purgatory. And a preconceived notion is a type of, this is a way of classifying it, a type of opinion, persuasion, sentiment, thought, or view. A personal belief or judgment that is not founded on proof or certainty. So once again, that's a blatant, screaming, lemon, yellow, loud uh, contradiction to the many infallible proofs of the Word of God in Acts 1-3. It's a screaming, lemon, yellow contradiction between the absolute certainty of the truth in Luke chapter 1. Do you see that? That's why I'm going over all this stuff. Once again, uh, this corroborates what we have already learned in the previous section. I spoke too soon. Uh, the many definitions about purgatory contradict Acts 1-3, many infallible proofs, and Luke 1-4, the understanding from above is absolutely certain. So do you want the absolute certainty and precision of the Word of God? Do you want the many infallible proofs of the Word of God? Or do you want these uh, crazy, uh, irrational, unreasoned beliefs like the doctrine of purgatory? Now, I'm going to explain this from a different point of view, from a lo uh, sheer logical point of view. It's called inductive logic versus deductive logic or reasoning. And so what is the difference between inductive and deductive reasoning? And that, this is a very important uh, enlightenment so that we can understand what uh, purgatory actually is. Inductive reasoning involves starting from a specific premises and forming a general conclusion, while deductive reasoning involves using general premises to form a specific conclusion. And here's the distinction. Conclusions reached via deductive reasoning cannot be incorrect if the premises are true. I've proved that mathematically when and logically uh, when it comes to the Trinity in my Shield of the Trinity article. And uh, it exp in that diagram, there are six violations of the laws of logic and mathematics in that one diagram. And it's absolute proof that those statements are false. And so it's very important to classify things so that you understand uh, the whole situation from a bird's eye perspective. So, once again, conclusions reached via deductive reasoning cannot be incorrect if the premises are true. That's because the conclusion doesn't contain information that's not in the premises. Unlike deductive reasoning, Though, a conclusion reached via inductive reasoning goes beyond the information contained within the premises. It's a generalization, and generalizations aren't always accurate. Okay, in other words, if I have the preconceived notion, remember that definition, that purgatory is a true biblical doctrine, then I would go to the Bible and cherry pick and distort only the verses that seem to support my belief and ignore all others because my belief is the premise. This is not being a good workman of the word because it's an example of partiality or bias which contradicts God's true wisdom. You see how that ties together? All these 
uh, denominational beliefs that only that one denomination believes in is a manifestation of partiality or bias which contradicts God's wisdom which is proof that that specific denominational belief that denominational bias is the wisdom of this world which is earthly sensual and devilish as opposed to God's true wisdom which is without partiality and an interesting side note here I did a research study on God's wisdom and I have proven through the wisdom of God that God did not forsake Jesus on the cross because it contradicts God's wisdom so think about that one so the correct way to approach this problem is to go to the Word of God in order to discover what the true premises are first even if the Bible does not support my belief what people do like with the RC Church is they decide well uh, purgatory has to be true and so now I'm gonna go to uh, only the Bible verses that I have to twist and distort to support my belief you see how corrupt that is you see how biased that is you see how wrong that is you know anybody can believe anything go to the Bible and twist and distort uh, the verses take them out of context and not look at all the other verses on the subject and try to prove their point that doesn't prove anything it just supports their denominational bias their corrupt biases well if we want truth we can't be wanting bias they, this, those two are incompatible in the true word of God all the verses on the same subject will be in harmony in the original word of God that is here's the definition of unreason inability or unwillingness to think or act rationally reasonably or sensibly like irrationality uh, it's a lack of reason or lack of sanity it's madness confusion disorder chaos for example a world torn by unreason so if it's a lack of of sanity then that means it's insane if it's madness confusion disorder and chaos then those four things are all psychological and spiritual weapons of Satan of the devil look at that madness confusion disorder and chaos there's a definition of bias it's partiality that prevents objective consideration of an issue or situation so once again that contradicts the wisdom of God here's the verb influence from an in an unfair way like a bribe or a threat is an example of that so you see you know bribes and threats all over the place thus denominational bias is when these definitions are applied to an entire de denomination now I mentioned the wisdom of God here's the eight characteristics of it in James 3 but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable gentle easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace now look at this all denominations and religions are guilty of doctrinal bias denominational bias which contradicts God's wisdom and is therefore the wisdom of this world which is earthly sensual and devilish and so now we're gonna we don't have too much farther to go we're gonna wrap this up here in a little bit now let's look at the Proverbs the book of wisdom Proverbs eleven fourteen. 
Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And you can consider counselors not just people, but Bible verses on the same subject. They are all going to be in agreement. Proverbs 15.22 Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. There's that word established again. Proverbs 24, 6, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in multitude of counselors there is safety. Look at that. You got safety. You got confidence. You've got establishment of the truth. Having a multitude of counselors is the equivalent of multiple objective authorities. Something that I mention in many of my articles and videos and use to rightly divide the word of God. It has been said that there are four things in life. Religion, corrupt religion, no religion, and true Christianity. I say the RC Church qualifies as a corrupt religion. How about you? What is the bird's eye view spiritually of purgatory? Let's look what's happening here from Proverbs 6 from the Amplified Bible. Another bird's eye view here. A, verse 12, a worthless person, a wicked man, is one who walks with a perverse, a corrupt, vulgar mouth. He spews out fiery darts of the wicked, who winks with his eyes in mockery, who shuffles his feet to signal, who points with his fingers to give subversive instruction. That's talking about a business deal in the marketplace, and there'll be uh, three people involved. You got two people that are trying to make some kind of business deal in the marketplace, and this worthless person, the wicked man, is the one who is uh, manipulating that business deal, that situation. He's pulling the strings and manipulating the people in the situation. And uh, that goes on all over the world on a global scale. Uh, these people, these worthless people, are called, they're born of the seed of the serpent. They have sold their souls to the devil. And that's why there's so much, you know, crime and evil and all kinds of uh, horrible things going on in this world who perversely in his art plots trouble and evil continually, who spreads discord and strife. Remember uh, what we looked at about the uh, all the debates on the uh, truth or falsehood of purgatory. Therefore, the crushing weight of his disaster will come suddenly upon him. Instantly he will be broken and there will be no healing or remedy because he has no heart for God. These six things the Lord hates, indeed, seven are repulsive to him. A proud look, the attitude that makes one overestimate oneself and discount others, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that creates wicked plans, feet that run swiftly to evil, a false witness who brays out lies, even half-truths, and one who spreads discord, rumors, among brothers. In verse 12, the word worthless is the Hebrew word belial, Strong's number 1100, and it's used 27 times in the Old Testament. And it literally means without profit or benefit, uh, worthlessness, by extension, destruction and wickedness. That sounds exactly like purgatory. It's without profit. It's without benefit. It's worthless. It's destructive and it's wickedness. These are the spiritual sons of the devil. Uh, these uh, worthless people here. A worthless person, a wicked man. Who I'm showing you who that really is. These are the spiritual sons of the devil and these psychopathic monsters are the real root reason why there are so many different denominations and religions in the world that breed so much doubt, confusion, and conflict between them. And the least common denominator, they are the root cause of all the wars in the world and they will never go away until the new heaven and earth way off in the future. 
This is why world peace is an impossibility during the age of grace because the root cause of wars cannot be removed at this time. This is why there's so much destruction, treachery, confusion, and darkness in our world. Yet we can stand against this evil and quench these fiery darts of wickedness and overcome the world with that steadfast truth of the Word of God that we have covered in so many different sections. So now we're going to wrap this up with the significance of number 13. Remember, this was the third section uh, that we were going to go over. So let's do the math. The Council of Lyon, France in 1274 is one year. The Council of Ferrara, Florence, it, you get 1445 minus 1438, and you have seven complete years. You have the Council of Trent, 1563 minus 1545, and 18 complete years. And so it's interesting to note that there were 26 years of fierce and unresolved debate See, that isn't a perfect example of that uh, sowing discord among the brethren that we saw here in Proverbs 6, which is caused by the worthless person, the wicked men. You see that? That's why this is significant. So it's interesting to note that there were 26 years of fierce and unresolved debate spanning across three centuries of time, and it's still hotly contested to this day, 400 and 60 years later in 2023. So, look at this. 26 is 13 times 2. And look what the number in scripture book says about the number 13. Hence, every occurrence of the number 13 and likewise of every multiple of it stamps that with which it stands in connection with rebellion, apostasy, defection, corruption, disintegration, revolution, or some kindred idea. That's why this is significant. There's 26 years, so it's double 13. It's established rebellion, established apostasy, established defection away from the Word of God, established corruption, established disintegration, established revolution. So here's a link to that book it's on uh, archive.org and it's a PDF file as you can see here in the website address and uh, it's 269 pages let me blow this up a bit it's number in scripture it's supernatural design and spiritual significance by E.W. Bollinger he was a uh, theologian in uh, Europe uh, 1837 to 1913 fourth edition revised London and um, this book is in the public domain copy freely more freeware from leavenwater.org here's the table of contents we can just skim through preface part one supernatural design chapter one the works of God uh, you got the heavens, chronology, nature, vegetable kingdom, physiology, chemistry, sound and music, color. Uh, there's specific mathematical designs in all these different works of God. Chapter 2 is the Word of God. And here there's a mathematical design and precision there also with the, the books of the Bible, the writers, occurrences of words in the Old Testament, occurrences of words in the New Testament, uh, and so forth. I'll look at all these phrases. Part 2, spiritual significance. Introduction, what's the spiritual significance of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 6 and 7 together, 7 by itself, 8, 8 and 7 together, 8 by itself, 8 and 13, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, 19, 20. It goes into several of the 20s. 30, 42, uh, 120, 430, 666, and a conclusion. So that's a great uh, book to go through and uh, learn all these uh, details on the biblical meaning of 
number. So in the next video, we will hit subsection number three, purgatory and world religion. So I encourage you to you know, do your math, do your homework, look at definitions of words, look at purgatory uh, from a biblical and spiritual perspective and see uh, if you uh, come up with the same conclusion that I have. God bless.